Thanks for the introduction, Shona. We're just going to have a conversation about the work. So it's going to be entirely casual. It's a Sunday afternoon. We thought it would be appropriate. Sit here up on the chairs and have a bit of a chin wag. Um, I want to open, we're going to talk about Balcony 2, which is um, one of my favourite Whiteley paintings. I think it's an extraordinary work, this, this vista of the harbour. Um, and of course, what's the first thing you notice about is this extraordinary blue, Windsor & Newton Deep Ultramarine Oil. Uh, what brought Brett to this blue and using this so dominantly in his work in the mid-1970s? Um, coming back to Australia and the colour, the light, more than anything. Um, I was quite surprised when we started rehanging some of the English pictures here, just how different the colour was. Because in England they read as rather warm colours, and here they, they, they're much, um, much more layered and much more um, dense and much more English light colour. And coming back to Australia, the immediate impact on Brett and on me and on everybody, and one of the reasons we decided to stay was the natural light. The, the white kind of bleached out thing, so you do a blue like that. Also the harbour changes like this. It's never that blue, that particular blue. Brett said about French ultramarine that it was something that hit a nerve end for him particularly. Certainly some of the French painters earlier that he admired, Matisse used a blue that was quite high keyed, but not as high keyed as this. One of the things that people don't really acknowledge that often with this blue is that it's often underpainted with a darker blue. A black, so it's not just a flat contemporary surface. Though, though this is painted on, on a canvas and when he painted on canvas, they, they're much thinner than when he painted on board, but there's always a degree of underpainting as well, which comes from his earlier works and comes from a bit of advice from Lloyd Rees when he was very young to rag off paint rather than and put it on in layers rather than just try and do a flat surface. You can see the difference between contemporary, um, so-called the next stage of contemporary non-figurative art, that is often very flat colour, unless you're a, a colourist and you want to just work colour field painting, but he, he never really did much. He did a bit of spray painting for the art back pictures, but that was the only time he did that. So it's put on with a brush, it's drawn on rather than kind of slashed on as a flat colour, and it's meant to donate a mood, so you might be thinking looking at flat French ultramarine, but you're actually looking at something that's quite moody in a way, the dark and the light. And that's the way the harbour is. The other big one that belongs to the art gallery here, um, a big orange it's called, um, is, is an orange light. And Lavender Bay really does change. I still own one called the Grey Harbour. There's quite a lot of rainy day ones. And on those days the harbour is actually quite grey. And then in the evening, you'll get a very warm red light sometimes, so it looks quite orange. And, you know, I mean, Brett's keyed the colour up each time. But it is very moody and very changing, which is another reason why I'm still there and addicted and, and got out of London <laughs> and came to live in Australia. Is that I'm just, you know, he was, I was, we're addicted to that Sydney Harbour thing. It's just beautiful. Why move? <laughs> That's a very good point. Um, I, it's something you said about the emotion and the colour as well. I and mean, Brett described this blue as pure optical ecstasy. Yeah. And he was referring to the emotion, not the drug. It didn't exist in 1974 when he actually made that statement. Um, that optical ecstasy of the harbour seems to saturate this painting as well. Um, and something extraordinary about it is that the emptiness, I mean, the blue of the water just dominates. The water and sky become as one. Um, was there something zen about that emptiness almost looking out there? Um, I think in, in um, all of Brett's more figurative works, he started to do, use a lot of empty space, but he didn't see it as empty. It's not empty, it just, it's full. It's absolutely full. It's not a thing. It's just that every, every. I mean, some painters work and, they, and uh, work on, and uh, draw. Even calligraphers and drawers will work with filling up everything, for you know, filling up every section of the canvas with the same kind of rhythm. Brett never really did that. He, he's never worked like Vincent, for example. It's a, it's an energy explosion of thousands of different lines. With Brett, there is always big areas that are not empty, but they're not full of, <laughs> they're full of feeling, they're not full of paint in that sense, or scratchy, scratchy lines. I 
see very much like that. I don't know how much that's got to do with my arts education, which happened at the same time. But when we went to um, Europe first in 1970, 1960, I'm mean, sorry, um, to Italy and looked at the 14th, 13th, 14th century Italian painters, they had a huge effect on most contemporary English and European artists. People like Cimabue and Duccio and things, and a lot of those earlier flattened space, certainly the flattened space, which we now call the aerial view, um, because we see the landscape from above in aeroplanes, and so we call that a flattened space and a flattened picture plane, is there already in earlier Italian pictures. And it meant a hell of a lot to um, young contemporary artists who, at the time, in 1960, who just rediscovered this about early Italian icons in churches and things like that. So you get vast areas in those sometimes that just nothing but gold leaf or something, you know. And um, Brett learned a lot from that. I mean, as an arts education, it was pretty eye-opening. That was the shock of the new for him and for me at the time, one, the scale, and two, being able to just leave something um, without you know, things happening in it. So it's less narrative in that sense. You know, there's no little men on the boats or anything. They're, they're forms, they're forms that sit one up against each other, and that includes the colour. And Wayne's right, I mean, this, this, the thing is one colour all over. So, you know, there's no real need for a horizon line. And yet, at the bottom of this picture, and quite a number of the bigger pictures, he puts a kind of frame inside the frame, which denotes a kind of thing of looking out from, into, a space outside that. I think in this work too, I mean, the aspect of Brick's word, work is the line. I mean, the line is often so important. There's a linear element to this as well. The line which sort of denotes the exterior of that expanse, but the balcony, um, the wonderful heron flying across with a little speed line behind him, the bridge up there, and the line is sort of sensuous as well. And, and I believe there's a connection back to Lloyd Rees, um, the, the wonderful Berry work we have hanging around the corner, but also Brett's own interest in the line. Where did that come from? The interest in the line really came more, not so much from, from Lloyd's earlier works, because that was more about the mass, the form, right. the sensuality that he saw in Lloyd's work, which surprised Lloyd Rees enormously when he told him about how sexy his pictures were. Mm. Um, and Brett took that straight into his abstract pictures. He's, you know, clearly in 1960 up to about 1964, when he changed back and started painting the bathrooms, but you're still getting a much more kind of amorphic mass. The linear thing comes from, you, one, a respect for um, Chinese and Japanese calligraphy. The abstract things, there's a work over there behind you, which you can see where people are starting to use line up against an empty space, so-called. So that at the same time, you, you're trying to, you know, kind of um, donate a, an object or something happening or donate a feeling of somewhere being there. At the same time, it's abstracted by the use of the line. It's controlled and it's both controlled and abstracted by the freedom, the looseness of the line. So he never really wanted to, he didn't paint plain air for a start. These are painted from, often painted from inside Lavender Bay, so he didn't need to. But the big outback pictures and things, the flies and the people talking to him drove him nuts. So he, you know, get a, an image in his head and take it back to the studio. So it's, it's never trying to do photo realism or, or donate anything except the mood and the feel and the romance of Sydney Harbour with the harbour pictures. That includes both the interiors and the exteriors from Lavender Bay. Plus it's where we were living and there was, you know, all kinds of ups and downs going on in one's normal life, but it was also the central focus of our life at the time. And, and um, Brett painted often from where he was, very, well, most of the time, in fact, painted from where he was. He continued to paint some later Lavender Bay pictures later on. They're very popular in this country. <laughs> and so everybody always wants one, you know, kind of. You know, most of the, uh, most of, most of them are bought by private collectors and sometimes they come back on the market and there's always a big appeal for them. And I think that's true of anywhere in the world that people have a different feeling from where they come from. Australia is often accused of being provincial, but in a way every city is provincial. If you want a career in New York, you've got to go live there. You've got to paint things that are relevant to New York people. 
if you want to have a career in London, you've got to go live there and paint there. And that's really, we did that until we came back to Australia. And from then on in, really, he painted mostly Australian subjects of one kind or the other, either landscapes where we were staying at the time, or the harbour from where he was living at the time. So there's a lot of emotion and kind of heart connection rather than theoretical um, stuff going on with Whiteley. Some people love it, some people hate it. Tough, you know, <laughs> you can't win everybody. You can't please everybody all the time. <laughs> Another famous line of Bob Dylan's. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, and you wouldn't want to please all the people all the time. I think it would make a very dull world if everyone's happy constantly. Well, Mix it up. <laughs> that's right. And these days, to be too popular is almost uh, makes people a virtue. <laughs> you get accused of being populist. <laughs> Just um, picking up what you said about Brett Whiteley painting from where he was, that element of painting from his life, what was life like on returning to Australia in 1969 after 10 years away in London, New York, coming back here? Well, we came back in 1969, 70, 1970, um, without any really intention of staying. I don't know where, the, where we thought we were going. Oh, in fact, we were, the, the theory was we were going to go and live in Fiji, but Brett got thrown out of Fiji um, for some drugs and um, they weren't very serious ones but anyway he got thrown out and Aki and I of course had to follow so we put the mini moke and everything else we had on the ship and came back here and were met by a huge amount of journalists who were very overexcited by the fact of kind of a successful artist you know pop star things that started to happen around artists then you know with long curly hair and his mad looking wife and his poor child who didn't know what was going on Neither did we, actually. So we came back. So, but it was meant to be to bring the Fiji show back to here, which we'd already put on in Fiji for the locals. Um, and they'd loved it. And then the English police arrived and threw us out, basically. Well, not threw Brett out, not me and Aki. Um, but that meant we couldn't go back. So then we went to visit a friend called Roland Schlick, who was a painter and architect who, who had rented the downstairs of Lavender Bay. We found that we went up to Mudgee, had a look up there, and Brett said, no way. You know, like, there's nothing growing up here except rust. I think this is fantastic. I think Mudgee's changed very much in the last 30 years. There's lots of things happening in Mudgee now. But, <laughs> I mean, we didn't really intend to stay, and we found this flat had become vacant in Lavender Bay, above our friend Roland Schlicht and his family. Um, so we moved into it, we just literally fell in love with it. Plus, a quite heartfelt plea from Aki, who said, please, can we just stay somewhere for a while? Because she'd, she'd made friends in Fiji, she made friends in Tangier, she made friends in New York, she made friends in London, and she was feeling a bit disconnected, and she was just about to be five, so we stayed there, and then truly fell in love with Lavender Bay. And, like, any other option just seemed a bit silly, really. And it's the first time we owned anything, to be honest. First, well, except the mini moke, which we owned in Fiji. Um, but the first time we even contemplated but doing things like buying houses and cars and furniture and all the stuff that goes with that stuff, which I'm sure you all are perfectly well aware, is the end of gypsy life, freedom, everything else, and you've got to pay your taxes and you know, do the maintenance, on and on and on. So, you know, it was the end of our kind of probably more bohemian kind of life that we'd had before. We were not hippies, I'll tell you that. We were not hippies. Some drug person told us we were um, ageing um, <laughs> aging pop star. What did he call us? I don't know, bohemians or something. One time earlier and said Brett was little Lord Fauntleroy and I was a small, you know, spoiled woman too. I suppose we were all of those things, but there seemed to be a point to it when we left Australia. And certainly we arrived in London at a point where it was kind of like everybody was doing it. You could throw out the baby and the bath water and then make everything new again. I think we seem to be reaching a point here where everyone's a bit kind of doesn't know what to do next in this country. We might have to have another revolution of some kind. <laughs> or grow our hair long again or something and rush out trying to be different. 
uh, and then it'll go on Google and that'll be the end of that. But <laughs> um, however, we were quite serious, but I mean, and Brett truly thought at one stage, very naively, as Robert Hughes pointed out, that art was going to change the world. You know, every artist hopes that the work they produce is going to have some effect. But looking at you today here, it's a nice big crowd, nice open day, you've all come, bums on seats, maybe there's a chance. I hope that Lavender Bay, this one, the balcony too, and Wayne's rehang is going to make you feel a bit more optimistic about Australia and its artists. And for God's sake, give that government a kick up the arse about Australian <laughs> culture. Because they keep banging on about it, you know. We should have a cultural image. And we keep, and the only time they ever really talk seriously about it is when they think they can sell it to the tourists or something. But anyway, we need you. We need you lot to actually keep coming in here. Don't go on Google all the time. Get a self, but don't, don't, don't let us have the four hour queues outside the place either, because I'll have to be at the end of it and I won't like it. <laughs> Anyway, I'm glad you came, and I need any more questions, Mr. Yeah, I'm going to hand you some more right now. Um, you heard that here, though. The revolution starts today. Thank you, Wendy. You're, you're leading that revolution, which is brilliant. Um, just coming back to that, I actually don't want to leave the 70s yet. Um, just in the sense that, um, coming back to Australia too, it was a new phenomena, the artist as celebrity. I mean, the amount of media attention you had from getting off that boat in 1970 after being thrown out of Fiji, it built through the 70s. And that cult of personality, which became so closely associated with Brett and yourself, um, it, it made it difficult to see the art at times and for people to view it objectively. We've got a bit of distance now. What do you think led to that cult of celebrity around you both? What was the... Uh, well, I mean, it had happened before here, as of usual. Of course, in the early 60s, yeah. I mean, I, I think when we came back in 1970, the 60s was just beginning in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in a way, it was. <laughs> um, so. You know, I don't think it's, it's not quite as true, but there's always a kind of time, a bit of a time lag for those kind of international things that happen. There was a small group of people that felt like minded. Most of us had left in the fist. We were run, we were running from from the kind of suffocating feel, and that's changed enormously. And I think the cult of celebrity just came at the same time. It wasn't just Brett and me. It was, you know happened to all the English artists that had some success, it happened to the Americans that had success, mm. and it certainly was altered by the fact that people started buying contemporary art, yeah. you know, um, because part of that celebrity leads to, you know, people buying stuff and then the auction houses grabbing it and the amount of galleries and things that have opened since that cult of personality started. In the end, it makes absolutely no difference to what's being produced. And I don't know, I, I think I've managed to stand back a bit from, from Brett the painter, from Brett the man, who I was married to. And I'm quite hard on him sometimes, in a way, because I need to feel that I can detach enough to be able to judge the work. And, um, you know, I don't know whether if you believe this, but I think he's one of the most important artists that Australia has ever produced. I don't mean just in the last 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or in his lifetime. Um, some of the things he did for the Archibald and things like that were quite radical in their time. Um, and there's still a lot to learn from a man who thinks and works like that, that doesn't actually fit the mould of, you know, being what everybody else should or shouldn't be doing in his time. He struggled with it all his life, you know, trying not to bore himself to death. I struggle with I come and do these things. I think, oh my God, the worst thing that could happen is not just boring you, but boring myself to death while I'm sitting there. So I'm kind of like, going, oh, here I go again. Me, 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 talk, talk, talk. If you fall off your chair, we know you've actually bored yourself. <laughs> That'd be exhausting. You're still upright. <laughs> Um, one thing I just want to say, um, and we might take some questions from the audience in a moment as well, I think. It's a great opportunity. But we have um, Brett's portrait of the artist in his studio from 1976, which won the Archibald Prize in 76. It's actually hanging on the stairwell on the way up to the symbolism show. Um, this is such a peaceful picture in some ways, and that's such an intense painting painted a year later. 
where his reflection, the self-portrait is reflection in the mirror and he looks so sort of wired and anxious in that. There's a very yin and yang element between these two works in some, in some ways. Is that what life was like at that time for Brett? And uh, yeah, it was. Um, it was always like that for him, really. Um, he had the ability, he had an ability to be able to switch off, which I don't have quite so well. I'm a kind of like, you know, perfectionist and things, but we could be in each other's company quite a lot because we were both intent on doing our own thing, whatever it was. Um, but he could go into a space where he just switch off. And people could come to me and say, what did I do wrong? You know, he was so friendly a minute ago and then suddenly bang, you know, you think. It, it, life was always intense for him. He was, he had, he set himself very high goals. He loathed the feeling of failure in himself. Um, so if he wasn't kind of, you know, there's a lot of stuff out of his notebooks that we've had up around the walls and things, but if he wasn't, if he was boring himself, but the word boring is not deep enough really, if he wasn't able to transformation, alchemy is serious in the sense that that's what he expected of art, his own art in particular, and he set himself up against some pretty you know, amazing other artists um, in all forms, but mostly painting. Um, and that's what he wanted to achieve. And when he didn't, he got very depressed, you know, and very dark. And then of course, you know, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, the drug addiction wasn't helping. It seemed to for a while, in the kind of sense of being able to be still for a while and feel relaxed. Really, one was comatose, but you know, it felt like being relaxed at the time until you become addicted to it and then it becomes its own problem. You know, all drugs, all things that you love can have that, you know, in a way, the attachment to anything, to a car, a house, a, you know, a painting can have that dark side effect. But with heroin, it was a struggle, you know, and a complete moral dilemma. And that painting, as is the second Archibald winner, Art Life and the other thing, which is not up at the moment, um, they're confessional. They're, they're, but they're confessions to himself. They're not so much he wants to tell you all about it. He wants, he, he doesn't mind telling you. It's not that he wants to, it's not like going to a priest though to rid himself of it. He's trying to understand what the hell is going on psychologically with himself. And he was a great believer in the duality of human existence and of human beings, that we are all capable of very dark things in the right circumstances, that very, very few of us achieve um, Buddhahood or can rise above it to the degree where you feel no animosity or pain and, and you inflict it on others. So he, these questions were important to Brett. I, I don't know how much they were therapised by his painting, not really. He just kept trying, you know, trying to work it out. So he, he wasn't happy with himself ever, really. There wasn't, you know, there always had to be some other element added. I don't know how he would have dealt with old age. I think it terrified him. In the same way that it terrifies most um, painters, the loss of virility, you know, the loss of being able to think of something um, that didn't, wasn't just merely repetition, you know. So, on the other hand, he didn't much admire five-minute idea art either, so. <laughs> Conceptual art That's wasn't good for his thing. five minutes, <laughs> yeah. I think, um, w without anyway lingering on it, um, I, I think it's interesting these paintings are produced when you and Brett do start using heroin. It's that mid-70s moment, a moment of being on the harbour with all this beauty in front of you. But having talked to um, other people I know who used heroin in the 70s, it's just the, the ease with which people slipped into using it. It, it wasn't necessarily... Um, the, the horrors which could result weren't perceived amongst others I've spoken to. It was just... Something which we you didn't know about for. them. No, we didn't know about them. I mean, now I tend to think about it, it was really being quite stupid because we had been in New York for a couple of years, but you didn't really see it in New York, and it certainly hadn't um, hit the middle classes. It was a ghetto thing in New York, a black ghetto. In Australia, it didn't exist in the middle classes. Um, before we went away, you, were, you would have been considered, you know, pretty, I mean, it was pretty boozy culture and still is Australia. You know, the rites of passage was about booze, not about particularly drugs in those days. If you were a bit of a, 
you know, veering off to the left, you might smoke a bit of marijuana, but the use of opium, heroin, all these new drugs that have come since then, speed, everything, didn't exist then. They, you can't hear? Sorry, no, something's happened now. They can't hear. Hello? All right, so, I mean, it was really a question of, it was just time. Mm. People slipped into it because suddenly it was available and that was a lot to do with the Vietnam War and people coming back from Vietnam, either American soldiers or Australian soldiers coming back, um, bringing it with them. So suddenly it was on the open market and being the kind of people we were and a lot of other people were, you just thought, oh, I'll try this. You know, I'll have a try. We'd smoked opium once before in New York, but, but, and that's what Brett got busted for. In Fiji was a little bit of opium that he bought from a Chinese person, but he had absolutely no idea how to use it, you know, make the pipe and do all that. And he ate it and made himself very sick and <laughs> threw it in the drawer, and that was the end of that. So it's not like we were highly skilled in the use of drugs or anything, and we went into it really naively, mm. you know, of course, we knew the romantic kind of connotations of the use of um, things like that, and people had died of, you know, but they're all people that you never think it's going to be you. And it killed Brett in the end. There's absolutely no doubt about that. He didn't survive it, and I haven't used any kind of a drug for 22 years now, so I've got, I'm pretty used to it. You know, I'm used to being a um, unstoned clear-headed, possibly, from time to time, just on the brink of, you know, for all those old people stuff to start happening, probably. <laughs> Who are you? I don't know. <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> I think the newspaper said I was Wendy Whiteley. <laughs> well, I'm certainly hoping you are. <laughs> She's an imposter. She's doing a very good job. <laughs> I think on that note, why don't we take just a few questions from the audience. I've got one right back here. Uh, I don't think it's, it's, it's uh, necessarily uh, an underappreciation of Australian abstract work. I think that what happened was that those were all painted in Europe before we came back here. So there were a few very early ones that Brett painted before he won the scholarship to go, tiny little gold mining ones and things, which we have in the collection between here and the studio. Um, they bought an, a couple of abstractions for the Art Gallery of New South Wales and some have been gifted, I think. And of course, they're all—they're hoping that I'll give them the rest. But <laughs> we are. <laughs> Depends how they behave. And we're, <laughs> we're about to have at the Whiteley Studio a uh, work called the London Years. So, if you want to get a good look at the collection as a whole, um, that comes from here and from the studio or from the house or wherever. Um, come and see that show. It's going to be things. I think they just weren't known in this country. And since the book has been done in the 60s, you know, those 10 years by Cathy Sutherland, um, you know, it's been very helpful to me too because a lot of the stuff had just disappeared into people's houses and things. And it's only recently that it has started to come out from private collections in Europe and things. And they have a funny way of winding up back here. Mostly probably, I think, because the auctioneers think they'll get better prices for them here. But I think that's doubtful because, in a way, they're not known enough here. And if you, if you love them, as I do, I do think they are underappreciated. But the more they're seen, then obviously the more people will understand them and make up their own minds about... The interesting thing for Australia about it is the connection with Lloyd Rees and the early Italians, you know, to see where that form of abstraction went. There's not that much of that kind of abstraction in the Australian abstractionists, actually. They had a tendency to go more for the kind of abstract expressionism. Gesture, gesture. We've got time for one more question. So who's got a burning question? You've always wanted to ask Wendy. Now's your chance. If there's no questions, I'm going to... Oh. What, what would be your advice for you for up and coming out? If you meant it, what do you say to them? Uh, the question was, what would Wendy's advice be to young up-and-coming artists? How would you mentor them? What would your advice be? Uh, <laughs> I don't, well, uh, the question is odd because what do you mean by up-and-coming? 
uh, I'll give the same advice Brett would have given, which is first get a piece of paper, <laughs> start and keep tearing them up until you convince yourself that at least you've got some talent. I think, I think a lot of young artists are overexposed far too young, frankly. Though same amount have been said for really, I mean, he did get a career very young. But um, all of these exhibitions for emerging, I think it's called now, not up and coming, emerging young artists well ahead of time for them to really know whether they even really want to do it. You really have to want to do it. I mean, I had a lot of talent too, but I didn't have that incredibly strong desire to want to do it, you know, and put yourself up against the line, make a fool of yourself when you had to, you know, be judged all the time by other people, you know, by critics and things, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's a tough, it's not an easy life. The pop star bit is a load of crap, really. What you could, you're in that, you know, you're in a studio or doing whatever you do for many, many hours of a day, and you've got to come up against your own you know, desire. And if you've got any perfectionism in you, that's what I'd say, really f figure out whether you really want this life, because it's not what you think it is from the media or from the romanticized versions, you know, it's just, you need a particular kind of personality. You also need a bloody good visual education, which we haven't been getting too much of in this country for a long time. You know, it's, you've got to really look the only thing I taught, the only thing I was ever told at art school that meant anything to me at all was that somebody said, "Your job is to learn to see," which means, and I am constantly amazed at how people don't use their eyes. They really don't. It's just I don't know whether it's brain chemistry or what goes on, but to, you know, to look at paintings, you've got to see what form, how form one form lies against another. You have to look at the actual quality of the paint or whatever's happening. You have to look at the... There's a whole spectrum of things, but you do need to use your eyes. You know, and you know, the more you know, the better it is. So haunting museums in Europe or anywhere else, not relying on Google to tell you, you know, because it is a different experience. It's a very, very different experience looking at things through a screen on television or anywhere else on a computer than actually standing in front of a picture and just giving yourself time to actually open your eyes and see it. There are some paintings like the Mona Lisa which you'll never see properly because it's so over imbued with icon status, you know. And maybe that can be said of a lot of pictures in here too, maybe even including that. That the kind of veneer of, you know, notoriety hangs over it. But I don't think so yet. If I don't shut up, it will be, though. <laughs> 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 a wonderful moment of self-censorship there. But um, uh, please do continue to enjoy looking at the art of the gallery here, but also do visit the Brett Whiteley studio in Surrey Hills and Raper Street. It is extraordinary to be able to go into the space where Brett made work in the last year and experience the studio as he left it. Um, and the London Years is going to be the next exhibition there from July, but we still have the current one on display now. So please join me in thanking Wendy. That was a really enjoyable talk. <laughs>